Mirror of the Sea by Joseph Conrad Rules of East and West There is no part of the world of coasts, continents, oceans, seas, straits, capes, and islands which is not under the sway of a reigning wind, the sovereign of its typical weather. The wind rules the aspects of the sky and the action of the sea, but no wind rules unchallenged his realm of land and water. As with the kingdoms of the earth, there are regions more turbulent than others. In the middle belt of the earth, the trade winds reign supreme, undisputed, like monarchs of long-settled kingdoms, whose traditional power checking all undue ambitions is not so much an exercise of personal might as the working of long-established institutions. The intertropical kingdoms of the trade winds are favorable to the ordinary life of a merchant man. The trumpet call of strife is seldom borne on their wings to the watchful ears of men on the decks of ships. The regions ruled by the northeast and southeast trade winds are serene. In a southern-going ship, bound out for a long voyage, the passage through their dominions is characterized by a relaxation of strain and vigilance on the part of the seamen. Those citizens of the ocean feel sheltered under the aegis of an uncontested law, of an undisputed dynasty. There, indeed, if anywhere on earth, the weather may be trusted. Yet not too implicitly. Even in the constitutional realm of trade winds, north and south of the equator, ships are overtaken by strange disturbances. Still, the easterly winds, and generally speaking, the easterly weather, all the world over, is characterized by regularity and persistence. As a ruler, the east wind has a remarkable stability. As an invader of the high latitudes, lying under the tumultuous sway of his great brother, the wind of the west, he is extremely difficult to dislodge by the reason of his cold craftiness and profound duplicity. The narrow seas around these isles, where British admirals keep watch and ward upon the marches of the Atlantic Ocean, are subject to the turbulent sway of the west wind. Call it northwest or southwest, it is all one, a different phase of the same character, a changed expression on the same face. In the orientation of the winds that rule the seas, the north and south directions are of no importance. There are no north and south winds of any account upon this earth. The north and south winds are but small princes in the dynasties that make peace and war upon the sea. They never assert themselves upon a vast stage. They depend upon local causes, the configuration of coasts, the shapes of straits, the accidents of bold promontories round which they play their little part. In the polity of winds, as amongst the tribes of the earth, the real struggle lies between east and west. The west wind reigns over the seas surrounding the coasts of these kingdoms, and from the gateways of the channels, from promontories, as if from watchtowers, from estuaries of rivers, as if from postern gates, from passageways, inlets, straits, firths, the garrison of the isle, and the crews of the ships going and returning, look to the westward to judge by the varied splendor of his sunset mantle the mood of that arbitrary ruler. The end of the day is the time to gaze at the kingly face of the westerly weather, who is the arbiter of ships' destinies. Benignant and splendid 
or splendid and sinister, the western sky reflects the hidden purposes of the royal mind. Clothed in a mantle of dazzling gold, or draped in rags of black clouds like a beggar, the might of the westerly wind sits enthroned upon the western horizon, with the whole North Atlantic as a footstool for his feet, and the first twinkling stars making a diadem for his brow. Then the seamen, attentive courtiers of the weather, think of regulating the conduct of their ships by the mood of the master. The wind is too great a king to be a dissembler. He is no calculator, plotting deep schemes in a somber heart. He is too strong for small artifices. There is passion in all his moods, even in the soft mood of his serene days, in the grace of his blue sky, whose immense and unfathomable tenderness reflected in the mirror of the sea, embraces, possesses, lulls to sleep the ships with white sails. He is all things to all oceans. He is like a poet seated upon a throne, magnificent, simple, barbarous, pensive, generous, impulsive, changeable, unfathomable. But when you understand him, always the same. Some of his sunsets are like pageants, devised for the delight of the multitude, when all the gems of the royal treasure house are displayed above the sea. Others are like the opening of his royal confidence, tinged with thoughts of sadness and compassion, and a melancholy splendor meditating upon the short-lived peace of the waters. And I have seen him put the pent-up anger of his heart into the aspect of the inaccessible sun, and cause it to glare fiercely like the eye of an implacable autocrat out of a pale and frightened sky. He is the warlord who sends his battalions of Atlantic rollers to the assault of our seaboard. The compelling voice of the west wind musters up to his service all the might of the ocean. At the bidding of the west wind there arises a great commotion in the sky above these islands, and a great rush of waters falls upon our shores. The sky of the westerly weather is full of flying clouds, of great big white clouds coming thicker and thicker till they seem to stand welded into a solid canopy upon whose gray face the lower rack of the gale, thin, black, and angry-looking, flies past with vertiginous speed. Denser and denser grows this dome of vapors, descending lower and lower upon the sea, narrowing the horizon around the ship, and the characteristic aspect of westerly weather, the thick gray, smoky, and sinister tone sets in, circumscribing the view of the men, drenching their bodies, oppressing their souls, taking their breath away with booming gusts, deafening, blinding, driving, rushing them onwards in a swaying ship towards our coasts, lost in mists and rain. The caprice of the winds, like the willfulness of men, is fraught with the disastrous consequences of self-indulgence. Long anger, the sense of his uncontrolled power, spoils the frank and generous nature of the west wind. It is as if his heart were corrupted by a malevolent and brooding rancor. He devastates his own kingdom and the wantonness of his force. Southwest is the quarter of the heavens where he presents his darkened brow. He breathes rage in terrific squalls and overwhelms his realm with an inexhaustible welter of clouds. He strews the seeds of anxiety upon the decks of scudding ships, makes the foam stripped ocean look old and sprinkles with gray hairs the heads of shipmasters and the homeward-bound ships running for the channel. The westerly wind, asserting his sway from the southwest quarter, 
is often like a monarch gone mad, driving forth with wild imprecations the most faithful of his courtiers to shipwreck, disaster, and death. The southwesterly weather is the thick weather par excellence. It is not the thickest of the fog. It is rather a contraction of the horizon, a mysterious veiling of the shores with clouds that seem to make a low vaulted dungeon around the running ship. It is not blindness. It is a shortening of the sight. The west wind does not say to the seaman, you shall be blind. It restricts merely the range of his vision and raises the dread of land within his breast. It makes of him a man robbed of half his force, of half his efficiency. Many times in my life, standing in long sea boots and streaming oilskins at the elbow of my command on the poop of a homeward bound ship, making for the channel and gazing ahead into the gray and tormented waste, I have heard a weary sigh shape itself into a studiously casual comment. Can't see very far in this weather, and have made an answer in the low perfunctory tone, No, sir. It would be merely the instinctive voicing of an ever-present thought associated closely with the consciousness of the land somewhere ahead and of the great speed of the ship. Fair wind, fair wind. Who would dare to grumble at a fair wind? It was favorable to the western king, who rules masterly the North Atlantic from the latitude of the Azores to the latitude of Cape Farewell. A famous shove to this end, a good passage with, and yet somehow one could not muster upon one's lips the smile of a courtier's gratitude. This favor was dispensed to you from under an overbearing scowl, which is the true expression of the great autocrat when he has made up his mind to give a battering to some ships and to hunt certain others home in one breath of cruelty and benevolence equally distracting. No, sir, can't see very far. Thus would the mate's voice repeat the thought of the master, both gazing ahead, while under their feet the ship rushes at some twelve knots in the direction of the lee shore, and only a couple of miles in front of her, swinging and dripping jib-boom, carried naked with an upward slant like a spear, a gray horizon closes the view with a multitude of waves, surging upwards violently, as if to strike at the stooping clouds. Awful and threatening scowls darken the face of the west wind in his clouded southwest mood, and from the king's throne hall in the western board stronger gusts reach you like the fierce shouts of raving fury to which only the gloomy grandeur of the scene imparts as saving dignity. A shower pelts the deck and the sails of the ship as if flung with a scream by an angry hand, and when the night closes in, the night of a southwesterly gale, it seems more hopeless than the shade of Hades. The southwesterly mood of the great west wind is a lightless mood, without sun, moon, or stars, with no gleam of light but the phosphorescent flashes of the great sheets of foam that, boiling up on each side of the ship, fling bluish gleams upon her dark and narrow hull, rolling as she runs, chased by enormous seas, distracted in the tumult. There are some bad nights in the kingdom of the west wind for homeward-bound ships making for the channel, and the days of wrath dawn upon them colorless and vague, like the timid turning up of invisible lights upon the scene of a tyrannical and passionate outbreak, awful in the monotony of its method and the increasing strength of its violence. It is the same wind, 
the same clouds, the same wildly racing seas, the same thick horizon around the ship. Only the wind is stronger. The clouds seem denser and more overwhelming. The waves appear to have grown bigger and more threatening during the night. The hours whose minutes are marked by the crash of the breaking seas slip by with the screaming, pelting squalls, overtaking the ship as she runs on and on with darkened canvas, with streaming spars and dripping ropes. The downpours thicken, preceding each shower a mysterious gloom like the passage of a shadow above the firmament of gray clouds filters down upon the ship. Now and then the rain pours upon your head and streams as if from spouts. It seems as if your ship were going to be drowned before she sank, as if all atmosphere had turned to water. You gasp, you splutter, you are blinded and deafened, you are submerged, obliterated, dissolved, annihilated, streaming, all over as if your limbs too had turned to water, and every nerve on the alert, you watch for the clearing up mood of the western king, that shall come with a shift of wind as likely as not to whip all the three masts out of your ship in the twinkling of an eye. Heralded by the increasing fierceness of the squalls, sometimes by a faint flash of lightning like the signal of a lighted torch waved far away behind the clouds, the shift of wind comes at last, the crucial moment of the change from the brooding and veiled violence of the southwest gale to the sparkling, flashing, cutting, clear-eyed anger of the king's northwesterly mood, you behold another phase of his passion, a fury bejeweled with stars, mayhap bearing the crescent of the moon on its brow, shaking the last vestiges of its torn cloud mantle in inky black squalls, with hail and sleet descending like showers of crystals and pearls, bounding off the spars, drumming on the sails, pattering on the oilskin coats, whitening the decks of homeward-bound ships, faint, ruddy flashes of lightning flicker in the starlight upon her mastheads. A chilly blast hums in the taut rigging, causing the ship to tremble to her very keel, and the soaked men on her decks to shiver in their wet clothes, to the very marrow of their bones, before one squall has flown over to sink in the eastern board, the edge of another peeps up already above the western horizon, racing up swift, shapeless, like a black bag full of frozen water, ready to burst over your devoted head. The temper of the ruler of the ocean has changed. Each gust of the clouded mood that seemed warmed by the heat of a heart flaming with anger has its counterpart in the chilly blasts that seem blown from a breast turned to ice with a sudden revulsion of feeling. Instead of blinding your eyes and crushing your soul with a terrible apparatus of cloud and mists and seas and rain, the king of the west turns his power to contemptuous pelting of your back with icicles, to making your weary eyes water as if in grief, and your worn-out carcass quake pitifully. But each mood of the great autocrat has its own greatness, and each is hard to bear. Only the northwest phase of that mighty display is not demoralizing to the same extent because between the hail and sleet squalls of a northwesterly gale, one can see a long way ahead. To see, to see. This is the craving of the sailor, as of the rest of blind humanity. To have his path made clear for him is the aspiration of every human being in our beclouded and tempestuous existence. 
I have heard a reserved, silent man with no nerves to speak of, after three days of hard running and thick southwesterly weather, burst out passionately. I wish to God we could get sight of something. We had just gone down below for a moment to commune in a battened down cabin with a large white chart lying limp and damp upon a cold and clammy table under the light of a smoky lamp. Sprawling over that seaman's silent and trusted adviser, with one elbow upon the coast of Africa, and the other planted in the neighborhood of Cape Hatteras. It was a general track chart of the North Atlantic. My skipper lifted his rugged, hairy face and glared at me in a half-exasperated, half-appealing way. We have seen no sun moon or stars for something like seven days by the effect of the west wind's wrath the celestial bodies had gone into hiding for a week or more and the last three days had seen the force of a southwest gale grow from fresh through strong to heavy as the entries in my log book could testify then we separated he to go on deck again in obedience to that mysterious call that seems to sound forever in a shipmaster's ears, I to stagger into my cabin with some vague notion of putting down the words, very heavy weather, in a log book, not quite written up to date, but I gave it up and crawled into my bunk instead, boots and hat on, all, standing, it did not matter, everything was soaking wet, a heavy sea having burst the poop skylights the night before, to remain in a nightmarish state between waking and sleeping for a couple of hours of so-called rest. The southwesterly mood of the west wind is an enemy of sleep, and even of a recumbent position and the responsible officers of a ship after two hours of futile, light-headed, inconsequential thinking upon all things under heaven in that dark, dank, wet, and devastated cabin, I arose suddenly and staggered up on deck. The autocrat of the North Atlantic was still oppressing his kingdom and its outlying dependencies, even as far as the Bay of Biscay and the dismal secrecy of thick, very thick weather. The force of the wind, though we were running before it at the rate of some ten knots an hour, was so great that it drove me with a steady push to the front of the poop, where my commander was holding on. What do you think of it? He addressed me in an interrogative yell. What I really thought was that we both had had just about enough of it. The manner in which the great west wind chooses at times to administer his possessions does not commend itself to a person of peaceful and law-abiding disposition, inclined to draw distinctions between right and wrong in the face of natural forces, whose standard, naturally, is that of might alone. But, of course, I said nothing, for a man caught, as it were, between his skipper and the great west wind silence is the safest sort of diplomacy. Moreover, I knew my skipper. He did not want to know what I thought. Shipmasters hanging on a breath before the thrones of the winds ruling the seas have their psychology, whose workings are as important to the ship and those on board of her as the changing moods of the weather. The man, as a matter of fact, under no circumstances, ever cared a brass farthing for what I or anybody else in his ship thought. He had had just about enough of it, I guessed, and what he was at really was a process of fishing for a suggestion. It was the pride of his life that he had never wasted a chance, no matter how boisterous, threatening, and dangerous of a fair wind. Like men racing blindfold, for a gap in a hedge, we were finishing a splendidly quick passage from the Antipodes. 
with a tremendous rush for the channel in as thick a weather as any I can remember, but his psychology did not permit him to bring the ship to with a fair wind blowing, at least not on his own initiative. And yet he felt that very soon indeed something would have to be done. He wanted the suggestion to come from me, so that later on, when the trouble was over, he could argue this point with his own uncompromising spirit, laying the blame upon my shoulders. I must render him the justice that this sort of pride was his only weakness. But he got no suggestion from me. I understood his psychology. Besides, I had my own stock of weaknesses at the time, it is a different one now, and amongst them was the conceit of being remarkably well up in the psychology of the westerly weather. I believed, not to mince matters, that I had a genius for reading the mind of the great ruler of the high latitudes. I fancied I could discern already the coming of a change in his royal mood, and all I said was, the weather is bound to clear up with the shift of wind. Anybody knows that much, he snapped at me at the highest pitch of his voice. I mean before dark, I cried. This was all the opening he ever got from me. The eagerness with which he seized upon it gave me the measure of the anxiety he had been laboring under. Very well, he shouted with an affectation of impatience, as if giving way to long entreaties. All right, if we don't get a shift by then, we'll take that foresail off her and put her head under her wing for the night. I was struck by the picturesque character of the phrase as applied to a ship brought to in order to ride out a gale with wave after wave passing under her breast. I could see her resting in the tumult of the elements like a seabird sleeping and wild weather upon the raging waters with its head tucked under its wing. In imaginative precision and true feeling, this is one of the most expressive sentences I have ever heard on human lips. But as to taking the foresail off that ship before we put her head under her wing, I had my grave doubts. They were justified. That long, enduring piece of canvas was confiscated by the arbitrary decree of the West Wind, to whom belong the lives of men and the contrivances of their hands within the limits of his kingdom. With the sound of a faint explosion, it vanished into the thick weather bodily, leaving behind of its stout substance not so much as one solitary strip big enough to be picked into a handful of lint for, say, a wounded elephant. Torn out of its bolt ropes, it faded like a whiff of smoke, and the smoky drift of clouds shattered and torn by the shift of wind. For the shift of wind had come. The unveiled low sun glared angrily from a chaotic sky upon a confused and tremendous sea dashing itself upon a coast. We recognized the headland and looked at each other in the silence of dumb wonder. Without knowing it in the least, we had run up alongside the Isle of Wight, and that tower, tinged a faint evening red in the salt wind haze, was the lighthouse on St. Catherine's Point. My skipper recovered first from his astonishment. His bulging eyes sank back gradually into their orbits. His psychology, taking it all round, was really very creditable for an average sailor. He had been spared the humiliation of laying his ship to with a fair wind, and at once that man of an open and truthful nature spoke up in perfect good faith, rubbing together his brown, hairy hands, uh, the hands of a master craftsman upon the sea. Humph! That's just about where I reckon we had got to. The transparency and ingeniousness, in a way, of that delusion, the airy tone, the hint of already growing pride, were perfectly delicious. 
But in truth, this was one of the greatest surprises ever sprung by the clearing up mood of the west wind upon one of the most accomplished of his courtiers.